good morning, everyone. We are a small but mighty crowd. House and quite a few of the guys are at a men's retreat, so that's why House is not here today. Um, and so, uh, which is, oh, I'm sorry. I owe like $100 or something. I don't know. <laughs> I use the word small. We were told, gosh, that was like two years ago. Um, God convicted us and um, said we should never use the word small because it's putting him in a box. And that uh, when we use small to, men to talk about our congregation, we're not allowing him to work, to grow, which he has done in ways that we never thought of. This was at the beginning of 2020. So, you know, here we are going, okay, we're no longer calling our congregation small, fun size, um, but this is God's house, and then, then the pandemic happened. And so we're like, now what? And what happened is we grew online, and we're reaching more people than ever. So um, so thankful for that. So we are, oh, let's see. Let's get over here. There we go. We are in the book of Acts. We're in chapter 5. If you want to turn to your Bibles, we're at chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Um, if you remember what's been happening, um, the disciples have been filled with the Holy Spirit. They're speaking boldly. They're claiming the name of Jesus. Healings are happening. Peter and John were thrown in jail because they healed a lame man. Um, they got released and said, don't ever speak Jesus' name again. Don't teach in his name. Don't heal in his name. Don't do anything that Jesus was doing. And they go right back out to Solomon's colonnade, which this is a picture of, and they still go out, they stand strong, and they speak the words of life to the people. Out in the open, in front of the Sanhedrin that just told them not to do that. Now, if you remember last week, we had the incidents of Ananias and Sephora that they were trying to trick the apostles and, the, and Jesus and God by saying, we sold our land, here is all of our money, but really, in reality, what they did is kept some of it back for themselves. Now, if they would have gone in and said, here is money that we want to donate, that would have been another thing, but they didn't. They said, here is, we, we purchased, we sold our land, here's all the money. And that's the big difference, is they lied. And what happened? They died. So, great Fear seized all the followers because they just saw what happened, but they're in awe of the, of the apostles. So that's where we are starting from, that the apostles are now going out, they're standing strong, and they're speaking words of life to people, and they're gaining more and more followers every single day. So let's get right into the word. This is chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. Now many signs and wonders were regu regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico, or colonnade. None of the rest dared join them. Interesting. Think about that. None of the rest dared join them. We're going to talk about that. But the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So as I read this, I actually had a lot of questions. And it wasn't about necessarily this verse, though the verse was like, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. But I had questions about my own faith, about our faith as a church, what we're doing as a church. I had some doubts, like, am I not bold enough? Am I not strong enough that when people you know, come by me, do I spread light and love and God's love and his word? Do we as a church, why are, are we not reaching out enough? Um, why are we having such a hard time with our community here and reaching them and bringing them in? Both churches are working hard to do that. And why are we not doing that? What are we doing wrong? 
um, there is a fear that, you know, maybe I'm not faithful enough, right? Is our church faith? I was going through this. This is how I prepared for this, right? So I'm having all these doubts, these fears. Am I not bold enough? But there is hope, too, because I knew where Peter, John, James, and all the other apostles came from. Peter was Peter. <laughs> I mean, this was the guy that denied Christ three times. This was the guy that, um, <laughs> that Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. Um, this was the guy that, you know, just cut off the servant's ear. This is the guy that just kind of was impetuous and did things that came to his, you know, spoke and did things that came to his mind. So my hope is, if Peter can become this bold, powerful speaker and apostle for Christ, so can I. So can you. So can our church. And if they're doing all these things, we can do them too. And so then I started kind of having that hope that I listed there. It's like, oh, okay, there's, there's hope for us yet. And so I want to concentrate on verses 12 and 13. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, apostles and they were all together in Solomon's portico. portico. But here's, the, here's that line again. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. So I want to con really kind of condense, get into that. But first, have you noticed that the disciples have now been called apostles? There was a switch. All of a sudden, the disciples are now apostles. So why, what's the difference? We're all disciples. Disciples are learners. They're pupils. They're followers. They're believers. That's a disciple. We're all disciples. Apostles are the ones that are called and sent. So where all apostles are disciples, not all disciples are apostles. And so when we look at that, they have this, now the apostle, the apostles, the apostles are the teachers, where Jesus, when he was on earth, was the disciples' teacher, right? So they were the students. Now they're the ones that are being called to go and to spread Christ's love, light, and word. And so now they have all these followers, and they keep getting more and more followers every single day some of them will actually turn into apostles. And I believe that all of us should be apostles. We'll get into that later. But this line, none of the rest dared join them. Kim and I actually had a little text conversation on this yesterday. And um, because that was, the, that was the line that stuck out. None of the rest dared join them. So what does that mean? Well, they were following them. They held them in high esteem. They they um, respected them. They were in awe of what the apostles were doing. But they were afraid. What had just happened? What did we learn about last week? Two died. Right? And Ananias and Sephora, they died. So now these disciples are like, what if we do something wrong? What if we say the wrong thing? What if we do the wrong thing? We don't want to be in trouble and die like Ananias. But what's happening now is God's showing, where God showed his judgment, now he's showing his grace and mercy and bringing more and more people in and healing the sick, right? But they're not getting that yet, not yet. So none of them dared join them. Dared, talmeo in the Greek, is to be bold enough not to dread through fear or deal boldly. So they were not, none of the rest dared. They were not ready to be bold. They were not ready to deal boldly or speak boldly or act boldly. And they were afraid, right? Not to dread through fear. They were still dreading through fear. What could happen? Because they were just new disciples. They hadn't learned enough. They hadn't experienced enough. They hadn't been following long enough. And that's okay. When all of us first became believers, think about when you first became a believer, what did you do? 
I can tell you what I did. We were in this big church at Grace, our mother church, Grace. I sat in the very back pew by the door. My sister-in-law and I did. And we'd come in just as before the service started, sit down, went through the service, and bolted. That was our church service. And then after we'd been going for a while, my sister-in-law said, maybe we should join a Bible study. Bible study? I had never been to church before this. I did not grow up in the church. My sister-in-law did. I had never, I mean, I got to that church and was reading the Bible for the first time. I'd seen, don't get me wrong, I'd seen Bibles, I knew about God, but I'd never been to church. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. And so we did, and a lot of you will know, uh, will remember Sally and Dale. They were our Bible teachers. And so Sunday mornings we'd get there, we'd do our Bible study, and then we'd go to church. And so it was baby steps. Now another thing I did, um, BSF is Bible Study Fellowship. It's an international Bible study. And when you fill it out, they ask you kind of where you are in your learning. And the first time I went, new. You know, beginner, baby Christian. That's what I wrote. After five years of Bible study fellowship, the leader who I'd gotten to know came up to me and she says, do you really think you're a baby Christian? Because I kept filling out baby Christian because I didn't think I knew anything. And she goes, we've wanted you in leadership since, you know, your second year. I don't think you're a baby Christian anymore, so you need to stop and you need to fess up and put the right thing down. And she changed my form for me. And so I'm like, thanks, Lucy. <laughs> and, um, and so I started thinking, you know, I'm probably not a baby Christian anymore. I've been a Christian now for at least seven years. I should have learned something. But I was still afraid. I was still afraid. I had this, none of the rest dared join them because I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think I knew enough. I didn't think I could um, really, truly be God's servant. And that changed very quickly after I started doing some prayer with Joe Johnson and, and stuff. So none of the rest dared join them because they were fearful. And I think we do the same thing. You know, we go to church on Sundays. Like I said, I went to, to my, our mother church, Grace, sat in the back, because it was a safe place to be. But then I left. And I didn't really do anything. And so here we are, we have our nice little churches. And sometimes when we leave, that's all we do. We, we're here, and then we go, and we go on with our lives. Instead of being out in Solomon's Colonnade. Out in the open. The, the apostles, i got to remember, they now are apostles. The apostles went out to the colonnade after the Sanhedrin told them not to speak in Jesus' name, not to heal in Jesus' name. Why did they go out in the open? So nothing was hidden. There was no slander that could happen, right? Nothing could be hidden. They were doing it out in the light. I think churches get in trouble when we do everything in our buildings and we don't show it to the world. Think about some of the big churches that have gotten in trouble. What happened? The pastors, the leadership, they do everything in secret, they do everything in the building, and eventually it get caught, gets caught up to you. I think our team is probably one of the most transparent teams we, I've ever seen. I mean, we tell you guys all of our flaws and mistakes. We tell you what's going on. We do not, there is nothing hidden from you guys. Our trustees are very open, and we have honest discussions. And so we're good at that. But are we good when we really go out into the world, into the marketplace? So is it, oh, we should only be in Solomon's Colony? No, it's not either or, it's both. Why is it both? Well. We need church. That's our home base. This is where we have fellowship. This is where we ha um, get fed. I mean, we get fed physically here, but hopefully you're getting fed spiritually. That's more important. But we do get fed, fed physically too. But spiritually we get fed. 
This is where we come to get encouraged. How many of you walk through those doors having just a rough week, a rough day, a rough morning? Yeah, hands up. Both hands, feet, everything. <laughs> and we come in here and we can get encouraged. We can feel loved. We can get fed. It's a reset, a refresh, and a renewal for us. It's a refuge. When the world is beating us up, we come back here to our refuge every Sunday. That's why it's so important to come into the, into the building so we can experience all this, so that then we can go back out into the colonnade, so that we can do God's work, that we can be his hands and feet, that we can be the disciples here, but out there we can be the apostles. That's what I want for our church. That's what I want for us. And when we can start doing that, guess what's going to happen? We're going to start making a difference in our workplaces, in our schools, in our families, in our friendships, at the grocery stores, at the malls, wherever it is. And we will see a resurgence of people coming back for the church part, to the home base, for the fellowship, for the feed, the being fed, encouraged, reset, refreshed, renewed, and a refuge. In 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16, it says, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepare, prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. When you're out in Solomon's Colonnade, you've got to have a, a reason for your hope and be prepared to explain it. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. That's why... Peter and John, the rest of the apostles, were in Solomon's colonnade so that no one could speak maliciously about them. Did they? They tried. But they had so many witnesses that said that's not what they're doing. But they had threats. And you'll see, man, Acts, I love Acts because, man, it's action-packed, right? So we're going to see more jailings. We're going to see beatings. We're, you know, deaths, stonings and stuff coming up. But they never were sh could be ashamed or slandered because what they did was God's will and in his light. So, what do we need to do to be like the apostles? To take our disciples, our di being disciples here in church and go out to Solomon's colonnade. One, we need to be open. We need to be open to what God has called us to do. We need to be open to hearing God's voice and following his instructions. Um, the prayer walk. So what happened, it actually happened a few weeks ago. I was driving here on a Sunday morning, and God said, and I, I was just kind of singing a song, worship song was on the radio, singing a song, and God, and God, I don't know why he speaks to me while I'm driving, but he does. And sometimes that's kind of scary because all of a sudden I'm someplace and I don't know how I got there because I was <laughs> with God. So I was just open to hearing his voice. He spoke to me and he said, whose ground is that? Speaking of this church's ground. We're having a man war over this ground. A secular war, a spiritual warfare over this ground. Whose ground is it? And he says, you need to dedicate that land to me. And I went, yeah, we do. I got convicted. We hadn't done that. We're trying to fight this. Well, the Methodists are, but we're praying for them. Um, but we're trying to fight this with man, with lawyers, with real estate agents, with, you know, the uppers of the Methodist church, rather than dedicating this land to the Lord bless you. And when we dedicate the land to the Lord, it doesn't matter what happens to it. It'll be the Lord's. 
whether we stay here or we go, where they bulldoze down the church or it stays standing uprooted, it will be the Lord's ground and the Lord will honor that and he will work no matter what happens. So we need to be open. So that's how we got to the prayer walk. So November 6th, we're going to be doing the prayer walk. So be open to hearing God's voice. And I thought, I just thought of something. We need, the second one should be be obedient to following his will. Because I could have just sat on that vision, that voice, that word of knowledge that he gave me. But instead, I was obedient and said, hey, I told house first. And then I told the other t side for next. And then we came together and decided on a date and I was obedient to God's word, what he spoke to me. Be obedient. So we need to be obedient. We need to be filled. Remember Peter, he was bumbling, right? And then he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We've read Acts 1-8 over and over that his boldness came when it was, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. So we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you feeling weak? Ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Are you fe feeling fearful? Ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Are you feeling sick and tired? Ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. He will give you strength and boldness and courage to do God's will. So we need to be open, we need to be obedient, and we need to be filled. We also need to be teachable. We need to be teachable. Sunday mornings, come. Listen, don't, I mean, how many of you have already started putting grocery lists together or, or things I have to do or what am I going to do after church? I've done it. Trust me, I've done it. So I'm not, it's not shame. But we need to come in here with a teachable spirit to learn what God has for us, to learn the word. We should be doing that at home too, being in our Bible, being in prayer, having that teachable spirit. The, dis the apostles never stopped learning. And we will see that as we go through Acts. There's one where God still is training Peter because he thought one way and God said, no, you should never think that way. Everything I made is clean. In your religion, you think certain foods and things are dirty or unclean, but they're not because I made them, they're all clean. And it had to change. He had to have that openness to hear God he had to be, have that teachable spirit to learn. And then he had to be obedient to go and do what God had told him. Because God, we'll read it later, but God um, told him to go into the Gentiles' house. Wrong thing to do, but he did it because God told him to. And God taught him that Gentiles are made in God's image too. And they are not unclean just like you and I. We're not unclean. We are made in God's image. Have a teachable spirit. Be willing. Be willing to do the hard stuff. Be willing to go out into Solomon's colonnade and speak God's love and light, his mercy, his grace, his healing, his comfort, his peace. Be willing to do what the Lord has for you. Sometimes it's hard. And sometimes we don't want to. Um, some of you will understand this a little bit more than others, but I was asked to run for a board it's through Chris Theo, their secretariat, kind of like our trustee board. Years, every year, they'd call me. Hey, don't you want to run for the board? No. Hey, don't you want the board? No. Hey, no. And one year, I remember I was out in our backyard, I was probably gardening, and the Lord says, you're going to run this year. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. It's the last thing I wanted to do. I had other things that were on my plate. I just really didn't want to. Yes, you are. Called my friend Debbie up, who was on the secretary, and said, hey, how you doing? We're chit-chatting. I'm going to run for the board. You are? We've been asking you for years. You always tell me no. I had actually told her no two months before. I know God just spoke to me, so I have to run. Yes put my name on the ballot, and um, everyone was excited that I was running. 
Um, and everyone thought I was a shoe in I was going to be on the board, and they were very excited because I had done other things, and so they, they knew my skill set, so they wanted me on the board. And so I was up on the women's weekend. I can't remember if I worked the weekend or if I was just up helping. And it was Thursday afternoon, and I was doing stuff and talking to stuff and helping people and, you know, doing my job, and the Lord says, you're not going to win. <laughs> what? You're not going to win. Okay, this is not... <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, just kidding. You're not going to win. Okay. So what was this reason? I needed to know that you were willing to do the small stuff before I give you the big stuff. I needed to know that you were going to be obedient in the small stuff before I challenged you with the big stuff. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lord. I'm willing. I didn't realize the big stuff was going to be so big and so hard, but I was willing. And so I remember after the voting was done and they announced the winners, I cannot tell you how many people came up to me and was like, what happened? You were a shoe in Everyone was voting for you and da-da-da. I go, it's not the Lord's will. I'm okay with that. And Pastor Paul Finley came up to me and he goes, I'm so sorry. I knew you struggled with running and all this stuff, and I'm so sorry. And I said, Pastor Finley, it's okay. Pastor Paul, it's okay. And I told him the story, and he just sat down, and he looked at me, and he goes, wow. Wow. He's going, that's amazing. And God's going to do something amazing in your life. I said, yes, he is. I'm still waiting for the amazing part. I've had a lot of the hard part. I'm waiting for the amazing part. So be willing. Be willing in the small stuff because God wants to continue to grow you and to call you. Be faithful. That is hard to do sometimes. It is hard to be faithful all the time. It is hard. I've struggled when my brother damn it, got cancer, excuse my language, it was hard. When we got the news that he had less than like 24 hours, which shocked all of us, it was hard. It was hard because he stayed around for a week. And it was hard when he passed. It was hard to have a faith in a God who, when we prayed and I was so sure God was going to heal him that he didn't make it. <sighs> and we're going through that right now with another young man who I've known since he was little. Same disease as my brother. And it's hard to have faith when you see them struggle and suffer. But the beauty of my brother was that God spoke to him. My brother didn't go to church. But my but God, I was going to say my God, our God, started preparing my brother four years before. Do you guys remember praying for Mila, our little micropeeny? For some reason, that little girl, that little baby, touched my brother's heart. Maybe because he had these beautiful grown children and he had beautiful grandchildren that weren't sick, that weren't born as previous, that never had to fight for their life. But he started praying and he would text me and say, he's answering my prayers. He answered my prayer. Do you get it? He answered my prayer. And I'm thinking, well, we were all praying that, but yes, he did. <laughs> but he answered my prayer. That's what he kept telling me. My prayer. Because he always said if he walked into church, a lightning bolt would hit him. And I said, yeah, even a sinner like you, Gary, God will listen to you. We had that type of relationship. I could talk to him. He knew what I was meaning. And because we knew that and we knew where my brother was ending up and he was ready to go home, 
we were able to have faith. Faith to continue praying, faith to continue going on. Doesn't mean that it was easy. And it doesn't mean that there will be times that our faith will take a hit. But we still remain faithful. Because in God, all things work out. They're new every morning. And we have faith. And at my brother's um, service, this is another thing, be willing and be faithful. God told me to speak at my brother's service. And I put it off for a week, hoping that somebody else would step up, and no one did. So I had to call my sister-in-law and say, hey, God told me. She goes, oh, good. I'm so glad. And so I got to share my brother's faith to all of his friends. And some came up to me and said, we're so happy to hear that because we didn't know. We didn't know where he was in his faith. We didn't know if he even loved God. He did. He believed. He had faith. God spoke to him, and he was home. Whew. Be faithful. Be humble. We're not that great, people. I'm just going to tell you that. But God is. God is our strength. Holy Spirit is our counselor. He gives us the boldness and the courage to do what we need to do. But we need to be humble in all we do. I love the apostles because they gave all glory to God. They didn't say, look, I healed these people. No, God did. So be humble. And last, be bold. In those scary times, we need to be bold. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. He'll give you that boldness. And we need to be bold when we speak. If you think I'm bold here today talking, it's not me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. I had a, kind of a crazy morning. I was talking with some people from the Methodist church. You know, I spoke over there for, or taught over there for four, four weeks, so they very comfortable with me sharing you know, all their stuff. But when, before you come to talk and teach, that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> so Linda and I went over and we just prayed. Prayed for an infilling of the Holy Spirit, a calming of my spirit. And then we came and worshipped. Truly, we're, that, I told Kim yesterday when I found out the songs that she picked, I'm like, those are great songs. And it helped me to connect with God a little bit more so that I could be bold and stand up here and speak. He helps me be bold when I go out there and speak. So we need to be bold. In John 14, 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me and also do the works that I do, and greater work than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. The apostles were doing greater works than Jesus because they believed and because they trusted what in Jesus' promises. They trusted in the promise of the Holy Spirit, trusted in the promises of Jesus. Whoever believes will, in me will also do the works that I do. If you believe, you shouldn't be just sitting here as disciples, but going out as apostles. I could ask the praise team to come on up. Go stand and speak the words of life. This is our Solomon's colonnade, right? People in our community, and this is a mall, <laughs> in our malls, in our open spaces, in our families, our schools, our jobs, our communities. With the help of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, God will send us to become apostles so that we can go, that we can stand and speak the words of life to people. When we start doing that as a church body, the people will then come in here to be filled 
so then we can send them out to go and stand and speak. That's how it works. That's what our calling is. Yes, in here we're disciples, but out there we need to be apostles, doing God's will. If you don't know what that is in your life, just ask, and he's going to let you know. So go, stand, and speak the words of life. Amen.